department. Fuck B. 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 You're now tuned into the Apartment 5B podcast, where we chop it up about hip hop, R and B, sports, love, and life. Hosted by Kill. 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 What's good, what's good, what's good? You are tuning in the Apartment 5B Podcast. I got my squad with me in effect tonight. As always, Little Sis Porsche. What's going on? Not a whole lot, Kill. So glad to be here. This is going to be such a great episode. I'm so excited. Dope episode. We have got my guy, Joe Songo, out in New York City, close to Queensbridge. Drummer from the New York hardcore band. What's the name of the band? Outburst? Outburst, yes. Outburst. Joe, what's going on, man? Good, good looking for making some time and chopping it up with us tonight, fam. Nice to meet you, Kill. Nice to meet you, Porsche. What's up, band? Long time no see. I ain't no doubt. Now, <laughs> if you've been following me, if you've been watching the podcast, you know I have been talking about this book going off for at least the last two or three months. I said it's the book I've probably written in the most. I mean, I'm taking notes in it like I'm back in college. I'm a Juice Crew fanatic. Love this crew. Love the MCs in this crew. I can't tell you how much I learned from this book. I'm 47. I know a lot of shit about hip hop. It's rarely any times that I, I learn a whole lot more. This book right here, I learned a whole lot more. I've been co-signing to anybody who will listen, and today we are chopping it up with Ben Merlis, the author of this book. What's going on tonight, Ben? Hey, thanks so much for having me. And thanks ah, for, man. For, for making the connection. Because Yeah, no doubt. Joe's the plug on this one right here. Yeah, I'm not on Twitter, I'm not and so this is this was a Twitter hookup. So I have Joe to thank for that. And um, I am on Instagram at Cold Chillin' Book. But yes, I'm glad you love my book. Okay. It's the only, book I've, the only book I've written so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what, what of many to come prayerfully because I've been co-signing this book all along. Y'all know me, we gonna jump right into it tonight. No way we could be talking about going off a book on Cold Chillin' and not be talking about the Juice Crew. If you know Apartment 5B, we try to do monthly by monthly salute shows give flowers while cats are still here you know number one r.i.p to bismarck a huge loss for the hip-hop community Porsche and i just did our twitter spaces saluting him we're gonna have a space tonight where we can just kind of chop it up about biz but tonight we are talking about everything juice crew top three albums top three mcs why uh what mcs from the juice crew make your top 10 list if any where does marley rank as a producer is this one of the dopest Hip hop crews ever. We're gonna talk to Ben about the book. So all things Juice Crews, as always, ladies first. Porsche, when is the first time that you heard about the Juice Crew? Okay, so I wish I could say that I heard of the Juice Crew or any member of the Juice Crew like right out the gate. Um, unfortunately, I didn't. Um, you guys know, or well, Joe and Ben don't know, but I grew up um, and I was like listening to hip hop when I was so little. Um, and that was in the, I was north of North Dakota in the most remote, like, it's not remote, it's just the most non-hip-hop part of Canada that you could possibly ever think of ever. Um, and so it was very difficult for me to get a hold of hip-hop. I say this all the time, I feel like a broken record, so I apologize for those who heard it. Um, but I didn't hear about the Juice Crew until I actually heard about chaos. RS and the whole bridge wars and all of that and then it was like well what's that all about um, and I have an older brother thankfully who kind of taught me along the way and so I was getting all of my hip-hop from him at that time um, so yeah it would have been yeah like early 90s that I, I I can't remember specifically but it would have been a few years or a couple years after you know debuts were dropping and things like that so that's when I first heard them all right no doubt Joe what about you your phone Queens so yeah. that's a huge part of the Juice Crew's Queen. So when did you first hear about the Juice Crew? 
Well, um, it's funny because in Queens, because you had the benefit of like Kiss FM and and WBLS. Nobody from New York pronounces the W, by the way. Just a little tip in case you ever mention like you know old school heads like BLS. You would have Mr. and um, Red Alert on in the background all, every weekend. And I think my first exposure was um, Roxanne Shantae, who would from around the way. So where I live in Astoria, um, Queens, it's about maybe three or four bus stops from uh, Queensbridge Housing Projects. So I think this must have been like 86 maybe or 87 when, as Porsche said, the the, the Bronx, the, the, the BDP and the, the MC Shan and Marley Marl War started picking up. And it, you didn't have the benefit of the internet back then, so just word of mouth, right? Mm-hmm. Hey, these guys, you mean MC Shan and Molly Wall are from Queens? Oh, they're from Queens Bridge, which is really close by. Like, it's just a cool, like, you know, the, the way it used to be, just word of mouth instead of uh, instant instant information. Um, so I have to say, like, my intro to the Juice Crew was from um, Mr. Magic BLS and then the Wars, which brought in Red Alert um, on the radio. And then they would, you know, do... Um, the bridge, and then they did the Bronx, and the whole evolution, as Porsche said. So, but my first intro, my my awareness of them and and Molly Marl was with Shantae. All right, no doubt, no doubt. Ben, the author of this great book that I love so much. When was the first time that you heard about the Juice Crew? I think it was. It must have been 1987. I have an older brother who is your age, uh, four years older than me. And so I really discovered hip hop kind of through his eyes. So I kind of got a jump start on a lot of other people my age, who are my age. And uh, he got the uh, Boogie Down Productions Criminal Minded album when it came out. So that's 87. Um, we got, the other advantage we had is our dad worked for Warner Brothers Records and they had they made a deal with uh, Cold Chillin' Records Cold Chillin'. In, in 1987 and we got uh, MC Shan, um, the first MC Shan album, probably after it came out, or right around the time it was being reissued. It got reissued the same year that it originally came out. It, all, this all happened in 87. And so um, we got that, and then we, and then we got right around the same time, I, I don't know exactly the order, but the single by Roxanne Chante called Have a Nice Day. And that was like, that was a big deal. We had we listened to that a lot uh, when we first got it. We were really into that one. And so we didn't, I mean, there were all these rap songs on the radio. We grew up on uh, 1580 AM K-Day. K-Day exists now, but it's not the same station it was back in the 80s. And K-Day was like the rap station and they played you know, there were all these songs about Roxanne this and Roxanne that on the radio, but it didn't really connect until that record came out, uh, which is about three years after the first Roxanne Shantae single dropped. All right, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. For me, it's similar to everybody's story. Uh, of course, Roxanne Shantae, Roxanne's Revenge in 85, uh, Shan with the Bridge Wars, but I don't think I understood that it was a crew. You know what I mean? I kind of felt like it was MC Shan and Molly Maul against Scott LaRock and, you know, KRS, Magic, Red Alert. I don't think I really got the, the gist of the Juice crew probably until Molly's in Control out. You know, where they have the infamous, one of the dopest uh, album inserts with them all at the airport. I think this was the first time I saw them all together. I mean, I knew Molly produced for Kane. I knew he produced for Biz and produced for different people, but I didn't, I don't think I put it together until like, like I said, that, which is one of the illest picks ever um, right there. Um, so that's kind of like when I was like, okay, like, yo, this is a dope ass crew. It's all about Kane, G-Rap. Biz, Master Ace, Craig G, you know what I mean? Roxanne Shantae, MC Shannon, and all these, the producer, like that was like the Chicago Bulls, like that's the all-star lineup, that's the ill coach with Phil Jackson, so that's everything right there. Tell me this, Porsche, uh-huh. who are your top three MCs out of the Juice Crew, and why? Um, I got Master Ace, Big Daddy Kane, and Cool G Rap. 
Um, and really, Master Ace, I mean, I talk about Ace pretty often. If any, anyone listens to me or reads my tweets, you know, um, Master Ace to me is just today i tweeted out i'm like i just think master ace was just dope all his life like he's just never not been dope um i i love master ace because i think his consistency is almost unmatched um his concept albums are top tier i i don't think anyone does concept albums and skits and interludes as well as master ace does um, I'm huge on, I, I absolutely dislike um, skits and interludes, except for when Master Ace does it. He's the only one so far. Um, and Big's my favorite rapper, and I don't even give a pass to Big. So, Master Ace. Um, Big Daddy Kane, you know, Kane is just one of those people, um, he's one of those rappers that just, I don't know what it is. He has so much charisma on, on record that, you know, like, you just all, his albums are just enjoyable. Um, very enjoyable to me so i really enjoy just listening to him delivery flow all of that kind of stuff um smooth operator is one of my favorite songs i love it i almost listen to that like every other morning on my way to work um it just is such a vibe and um cool g rap uh i don't like my favorite mcs are all g rap is like weaved into all of their stories like they the, he influenced them he was you know one of the first first rappers that they kind of looked up to the storytelling um all of that so g rap to me i think is also top tier and um i really enjoy his three or his four five six album so yeah all right, that's those are joe. my top three joe what about you top three mcs out the juice crew and why well, spoiler alert, because Porsche took two, you know, name two. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the spoiler alert, I think we're all going to name probably yeah. the gist of the same. It just may right. be in a different order of, you know, how, how we rank them, but. Um, so I'll just start with the one that you didn't name. You know, I love Master Ace. Ace is awesome. And if we talk about it later, there's, there's a cut. One of my favorite songs by Ace isn't even on a Marley production. It's on a brand new Heavies record. Um, mm called with me when i'm dead it's just awesome but we can hit you can hit that later in the show but i'm gonna go with biz Markey, right um rest in peace because i i shared a link with you a tweet with you the other day about um uh elray the rugged man like schooling right. Vlad's Vlad. and the argument just to put it in a nutshell was you know who, who's great mc and ra said this is one of them and Vlad disagreed, and then Ari just told him to sit down and told him why. Um, because MC is not just about your flow, it's about how you can rock a crowd, and, you know, beatbox, he was a total package. So I'm going to go with Biz as uh, number three. And then number two is G-Rap, of course. Um, you know, he's just, he did all of this, his wordplay was on par to me with, with like, Rakim and Kane. In that era, like, 1988 was when you first got aware of all these guys that don't just rap like you know um like the old school like they sound a lot different from curtis blow and you know furious five and and our g-rap was one of those who were just like what did he just say he would have to rewind it you know um and but again like how clever was he and so there's g-rap and then on that same note uh, as far as like intelligent like clever rhyme is big daddy kane at number one and i think we all can you know no one's gonna hard you know it's hard to argue with kane being the, the best MC in the Juice Crew as far as his skills, but he could he could dance. He, you know, he 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 had the clever interludes too. Um, so yeah, it's Biz, Q Rap, and Kane for me. All right, no doubt. Ben, what you got on tap for your top three MCs? This is gonna be so boring for everyone to listen to because my <laughs> answer is exactly the same as Joe in the exact same order. <laughs> like, no, don't fight. as you're saying, it, I'm like, no, you're saying the same thing as me. <laughs> But why? But why? But that's the thing that I love at 47. I'm always like, why? Like, those are the stories that interest me more because I believe music speaks to us all differently. You know what I mean? So you may have them in the exact same order, but they may be for different reasons. So I would love to know, like, why is that your order? Well, Kane is the is the greatest rapper who ever lived. So he's number okay. one. Nice. Even if we were just talking about any rapper or not even just outside of the juice crew the answer would still be number one big daddy kane um he's his rhymes are complex he can make them simple if he wants to 
He can dance, yes. Uh, he, he can rap about jokey things. He can rap about serious things. He can change the style of his flow. It's not the same style on every song. It's not the same style within every song. Uh, he has it's seemingly an infinite number of uh, lyrics he can put together. To I mean, he put out his first five albums in five years, I think. Yeah. Or he recorded them, at least, in, the, in five years. And um, so, and he also appeals to, you know, hardcore hip hop b-boy types, and then he appeals to the ladies too. It's like he's sort of all things to all people. And um, it's just so, like, he's, you just never want to battle that guy. I mean, you know, who's gonna do, who's gonna step to him? And then number two, G rap. Cool G Rap is right up there in my top three rappers of all time with Kane and Rakim. And Cool G Rap has this thing that he does where he uses this thing called assonance, which is when you connect words together that have the same vowel sound, even if they don't necessarily rhyme. But if you say the words fast enough, it works. And every now and then, my dad will listen to a rap, he'd be like, hey, those words don't exactly rhyme with each other. It's like, you're the only one who cares. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> most of them do rhyme with each other, but, you know, he is really one of the first guys to rap about, for better or worse, like, glorify the gangster lifestyle, you know, the gangster rap thing, which is mostly associated with the West Coast, but he was, he had rhymes going back to 86, like that. Um, so he's really on par with Ice-T uh, chronologically, but he's just, man, he, he can rhyme so fast. And one of my favorite things, God, who did I interview who said, it was his uh, guy named Dr. Butcher who did a lot of the scratching yeah, for, right. yeah, on some of his records, starting with the second one. Um, and he said, man, when after after Cool G Rap, he had this thing where they had to saw his head open because he had an infection in his brain. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, when he started, when he did Cool His Back, it's like, I don't know what they did in the hospital, but they made him an even better rapper. It's like, so that was a really cool story. And then uh, uh, Bismarck E, rest in peace. Um, like he's just one of these guys who I grew up, you know, I was like, I was nine years old when I first heard Bismarck e, and he was rhyming about picking boogers. And I like the first rap group I ever got into was the Fat Boys. I mean, when I was six or seven. So it makes sense that like a kid would love Bismarck e, but you know, listening to him as an adult, like the music still holds up. The rhymes still hold up. By the way, half of the first album, the rhymes are written by Big Daddy Kane. So obviously those are going to hold up. But, you know, Just a Friend is a brilliant song. And that's that's all biz. And um, he was um, musically exceptional. And I think people who are like hardcore hip hop fans know that and recognize that. And don't think of him as this like one hit wonder. Um, which is good because that's I don't think of him as a one-hit wonder either. Um, yeah, not you know, at all. This is a large reality who defies. Uh, um, he kind of he kind of breaks the rules of what we consider what we consider you know this is what makes someone a great MC, but it doesn't matter you know because right. there's this kind of like rule that we set for our heroes that they have to be they have to write all their own rhymes. You know, that's kind of a way of knocking a guy like Drake off of his pedestal. And I'm not a Drake fan, but that's irrelevant. But like, you know, you can't knock Biz off his pedestal. Like, doesn't matter. So that's that's my number three. Although, I mean, you can alternate Biz and G-Rap for two and three. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. Right, I feel you. And mine is kind of like Porsche's. I got Ace at number three. Uh, Ace's longevity to me has just been crazy. You know what I mean? The fact that he's been able to drop so many incredible projects 
going back to take a look around, which was like 89. You know, and I want to say him and Marco Polo just dropped their project maybe two years ago. You know what I mean? So if you started in 89 and you're still going in 2019, like that 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 longevity is unheard of. At that time, right? There. So that to me is like mind blowing that he's still is still rapping at an elite level. Like a lot of MCs from the 80s are may still be rapping, but they ain't rapping at an elite level. I think Ace is still doing that. My number two is G-Rap. I mean, G-Rap. I mean, just for everything. I mean, I remember the first time I heard Road to the Riches. It's just like incredible. No, first I heard Poison. That was crazy. Then I hear Road to the Riches. That's crazy. I get the album. I hear Men at Work. I remember being at my man's school's basement in Philly and just like, when is he going to stop rapping? Like, I had only other song before that was MC Light had um, Survival of the Fittest, where she like just spits for like 88 bars. But G Rap just going with Men at Work was just incredible to me. I mean, you know, uh, Rikers Island, just everything off that first album was a classic. G Rap, I mean, he had the list. G Rap is just one of them dudes that when you hear G Rap, you know it's G Rap. Like, it's no uh, misconception or whatever like that. My number one is Big Daddy Kane. And a lot of young folk always ask me, like, yo, how does Kane rank so high with you old heads? Because truth be told, only two of his albums, in my opinion, and a lot of people I know his opinion, were really incredible albums. Long live the Kane and it's a Big Daddy thing. And I have to explain to folk that back in the early 80s, mid 80s, a 12 inch was almost just as important as an album. You know what I mean? Because a 12 inch could hold you down for six to nine months. Like, yo, so when Kane dropped Raw, that thing lasted. I mean, it's, I always tell folks, it's not how it is now. Now you drop a song, you drop an album Friday, by the following Friday, people already want to the next album. It's like, what else is next? In 87, 86, you get a 12 inch, a 12 inch to hold you down. So when Kane hit you with Raw, it was like, yo, I've never heard nothing like this. Then he hit you with Set It Off. It's like, yo, I've never heard. Now, I mean, Kane was rapping at such high BPMs, which are beats per minute for people who may not know. And his tempos were just incredible. So being able to rhyme as fast as Set It Off, and then, you know, he would do little things like, I can sneeze, sniffle, or cough. Even if I stutter, I'ma still come off. Like, stuff like that, nobody was doing that. So it was just like, you know, I can remember when people heard Ain't No Half Stepping. Everybody in my hood rewinding it. How you say that? The B I G D A W D Y K N E. Like, nobody was spelling their, their words out like that. So I remember being a kid and everybody wanting to be able to, you know, do that. So Kane to me is just, even if, even if we just stop him with the two albums, I just feel like that was enough for me. You know what I mean? Not to mention the Lean On Me off the Lean On Me soundtrack. Then you had the B side with the rap for Kane. I mean, it, it, Kane just could not do any wrong for them first two hours. And then again, as hip hop moves on, and, and uh, one of the things I love that you talk about in the book is how, you know, once Kane left, they felt like they had to replace him, you know, with the genius, another dark skinned dude, and trying to mold him into what Kane was, which wasn't the genius, um, Stilo. But um, yeah, so mine is going to be Kane there. Porsche, tell me this top three albums out the Juice World. Okay, I got. Um, Master Aces, uh, take a look around. Um, <laughs> Big Daddy Kane's, um, it's a Big Daddy thing. That's the one with Smooth Operator on it. Yes. Yes, that one. <laughs> and Biz Marquis, um, Biz Never Sleeps. Okay. Um, those are my three. And Master Ace, listen, like, I cannot stop singing the praises of Master Ace. I think from when he dropped that album and then like his rapping with that production was just perfect for the time and it was exactly what the crew needed it was exactly just a really good chemistry between him and marley like it was just so well done that that to me is no skips at all um it's just dope my favorite joint is the one um the one with biz me and the biz um and i just think that yeah it's just such a good it's just such a good track it's so fun um i love seeing biz on there and to me like i do have to point out that master ace is like i feel like he evolves with the times as well and i think ben touched on it at the towards the end of his book that um when he was talking to them like you know quoting um that gangster rap was kind of taking over and things were kind of you know nwa and ice t and there was all these like 
you know, gangster rap things going on. And I feel like in a way, Master Ace kind of also evolved with the times as well. Like when you listen to Take a Look Around and then you listen to something like Disposable Arts, like they don't sound the same, but they still sound relevant for their time, if that makes sense. Like, I just feel like Ace was really good at that. Biz, I mean, you guys nailed it with your um, explanations. Um, to me, I like that album. Um, because Biz, I think, produced it, right? Um, and it, it was all Biz, like Ben had just said. Um, so I, I like that. And I think that this is the reason why you can't knock him off his pedestal. Because even if he didn't write all of his rhymes, you know, um, because he did so much that carries him. Um, and Big Daddy Kane, I mentioned it when I mentioned Kane. I just, that album to me is super just all of the charisma all of the smoothness the delivery the flow just everything um so those are my top three you know of course let me speak on that real quick because we spoke about it on twitter spaces but for folk who didn't get a chance to peek that the whole hoopla with writing your rhymes then versus now and not writing your rhymes i feel like it's similar to almost like a biblical principle in that if in the Bible, sex is sometimes a sin. Other times, sex when you're married is not a sin. When we were growing up in hip hop, if the four of us were a crew and Joe and Porsche didn't rhyme, but me and Ben did, but we're all crew, we're all friends, we're not gonna not kick, we're not gonna kick Joe and Porsche out the group because they don't write their rhymes. You know what I mean? It's like, we're friends, we're a crew, we're a group. So you know what? Me and Ben will just write Porsche and Joe's rhymes. You know what I mean? Because it was a street thing. Like this is this is why I'm always trying to explain to younger folk that it was hip hop when we were, well, I know for me in Philly, when we were forming crews, we weren't thinking we want a record deal. We were just thinking we want to just be the dopest crew in our in our neighborhood. And if we go and battle other crews and everything like that, like, you know, we'll have these routines. And people I always tell people, if you really want to understand hip hop, the get down on Netflix is a great piece that they put together and just like with that crew you know books i think was his name the, the character's name in the movie he was the writer but he wrote the rhymes for his whole crew and when they would do their routines that's what it was it wasn't about getting a record deal now when you fast forward 30 years and now you have a drake who doesn't write his own rhymes now that's held against you because a lot of my mentees and my young boys would like kill i don't get it one minute it's okay if biz don't write his rhyme but he a legend then you shit on Dre for not writing his rhymes. And I just break it down that simple that when we're talking about a place of innocence, we're talking about a place of we're just friends, we 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 hold each other down, and that would be fucked up to me. To me, that would be messed up if the four of us were best friends, we did everything together, and we want to do a hip-hop crew, and me and Ben said, you know what? Joe and Porsche don't write their rhymes. They got to go. That's just not how it was happening at that time for hip-hop. You know what I mean? So just a little, just a little quick message on why that's why what, what the difference is. You know what I mean? And then as the years began to go on, things became much more lyrical. So it became very important for you to be able to write your own rhymes because that was part of it. We will talk about this when it comes up to Molly, because from Ben's book, Ben's book has me looking at Molly kind of suspect over here. Like, did you really produce everything? Because a lot of people are saying they brought you the records. But me being a producer, as you can see the records behind me, we're going to get really into that Molly situation. Joe, top three Juice Crew albums and why? Before I do, I just want to follow up on your point about the crew and your friends. Because I don't know if any of you are uh, hip to the uh, MC Surge podcast. Uh, have you heard the one about? Um, I've heard the po I I've heard of it. I haven't listened to it, though. Because the first season is all about Big Daddy Kane. It's like uh, seven or eight episodes, and Kane narrates it himself. And he talks about in it what you just mentioned, where you just wanted to have the dopest crew in the neighborhood. And through word of mouth, and you know, you travel to different spots to battle, and you find out, though, this guy's good. Maybe I can enlist him. And that's how Biz and Kane formed their friendship. I mean, I recommend it to anybody. It's, um, it's, it's produced by MC Search, but he does very little talking. It's all about Kane and, and search narrated, but it's it touches on what you had said about okay. you know Bruce. But um, back to the top three albums, I'm gonna go in control as number three because um, it's just based on the fact that it's got the symphony on it. Um, you didn't really have too many posse cuts back in 1988, um, which is that's probably one of the, the granddaddies of all posse cuts. 
Um, but other than that, you had tracks by Master Ace and Craig G. You know, Heavy D was on there. Sh uh, Shan, Shantae. It was a it was a nice representation of, like you had said earlier, for people who didn't know what a Juice Crew was. You picked up that record and you saw the back cover and you saw the symphony video. You 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 played both sides. You're like, wow, these guys are all like, you know, a crew, a, a, the Juice Crew, right? So. That's my number three. Uh, number two would be Going Off by Biz Markie. Um, just because it's kind of sentimental for me because um, I'm in a Biz kind of mood lately you know, because of his passing last week. But I just was listening to you the, the other day when he passed and it's just track after track. If it's not funny, it's like dope. If you're not dancing to it, you, you're laughing. And, you know, if, of course, Kane's writing on it uh, helps like, you know, like, man, that's pretty clever. But just Biz had to still deliver it in his own way. So that to me is quintessential Biz, like the part about, uh, if you notice in Pick and Boogers, Kane gets it twice. He gets it on the basketball and he gets it in his spaghetti. So oh, that's, right. you know, like it, it, if you're really paying attention, it's like, it's very witty. And then oh. uh, number one is also like Porsche said, Big Daddy thing. Um, of course you had Smooth Operator and you had I Get the Job Done, but there's so many, other like deep cuts in there that made you say like man this dude is for real like his crew met with mr c and you know with the videos with scoop and scrap but like, he was on top of his game with that there's a track on there called another victory um where in one verse he's talking about how he can't catch a cab and then he switches it off to the next verse it's like um instead of beefing like you know instead of doing like this feuding i have peace with and he names all these groups like Stetsasonic, EPMD, you know, Public Enemy. That's like a, I know people were shouting people out before, but that was one of the, and he made it all flow in like, you know, one breath. So he covered a lot of territory. That's one of my favorite tracks on that record. Um, and also like funny ones like Pimp It Ain't Easy, right? Um, that was the first time I heard Nice and Smooth. Yeah, Pimp, yeah, Pimp It, and then uh, there's a house cut by Mr. C. He just lets him cut it up. Uh, I think the house that C built. Yes, yeah. So there, you really had a, like a cornucopia of different styles that came brought you with that record. Right. So that's that's my number one. All right, no doubt. Ben, what you got for your top three albums out the Juice Crew? I'm gonna do it Joe style and go three, two, one. All right. To build the the uh, suspense. So for number three, I have Cool G Rap and DJ Polo, Road to the Riches, and right. the thing about. Uh, cool G Rap and DJ Polo is they have three albums and they're all, all just about equally great. So if anyone wants to pick, to pick the second or third album, it's like no, no hate there. I mean, it, they're all so great. But I picked this one because it has Men at Work on it and it's just like the like just unbelievable, like you talked about earlier, Kel. And then um, for number two, I have Bismarcky going off. Um, when this came out, um, I guess we got it a little bit before it came out, um, but it's just, every song is classic on it. Just about every song is classic. I'd have to look at the track list again, but <laughs> if it's not 100%, it's pretty close to it. And, um, you know, you have, Marley working with Biz, working with Kane, and a little bit of TJ Swan sprinkled in there, and a Cool V. So you have, you know, this kind of dream team, hip hop dream team in a way, working on this record together. And I kind of wish that, I kind of wish there was a little bit more Biz rapping with Kane, with Marley producing, if they had done more of that. If there were like, you know, there's the Rhyman with Biz song, we, right. you know, it's Cool and Biz trading off. Like, man, what if those guys were like an actual rap group and they did like entire albums together? It would have been amazing. And then number, my number one is um, Big Daddy Kane, Long Live the Kane, the first Kane album. I, I like it a, a little bit more than the second one. Um, it's got, you know, Ain't No Half Steppin's my favorite rap song ever. So it's got that on it. And there's an interesting thing in this in the book about how um, Blind Alley by the Emotions ended up on the Kane record, and it went through all these different hands, all these people. 
which is a really interesting story just to learn about myself. And um, it's got raw, it's got all, like the first songs I think of when I think of him mostly come from that record, uh, or from that album. Sorry, in, in, in hip hop parlance, record means song, which is strange to me because I always think of an album as a record, but um, so those are my, those are my top three, but you know, there's so many great ones. And I, I used to always say, uh, my favorite one was uh, you know, Marley Marlin Control Volume One, but that was like a way of being diplomatic. Like, this is there. This is a record where oh, they're all on the same record. I'm not playing favorites, but now I can just tell you what I feel like, and those are those are my actual three answers. But yeah, That's I cool. mean, you can't hate on on any album that has the symphony on it. Yeah, that's dope. I actually, my lineup is exactly verbatim to Ben's. Uh, Road to the Riches, Going Off, and Long Live the Cane. Again, Road to the Riches to me, I just, you know, the song, everything about the whole album blew me away, the production. Uh, Road to the Riches is probably one of the first samples I found, the Billy Joel sample, because my mom's was a big Billy Joel head. So, I mean, just hearing that piano um, was just crazy to me, and that's really what was a piece of what got me started with digging in the first place. Going off for all the reasons everyone has said, I remember copping it and um, I was going to my pop's house for the weekend and I'm looking at the track list and I saw Vapors and I thought Vapors was actually going to be about an STD or something because around that time Kumo D had go see the doctor, people had little songs about sex and getting diseases so I just seen the Vapors and I was like oh it must be about that so it was just bugged to hear what it actually was about um, and then again I just think especially Long Live the Cane and Going Off because they had the 12 inch build up to it. So what would happen is, I mean, you know, you had Raw, Set It Off, you heard Ain't No Half Steppin'. So you heard four songs before you even heard the album. There's only 10 songs on the album, you know what I mean? And so, but when, when you hear Long Live Decay, the, the intro song, uh, on the bug tip with school, you know, rapping, like just all that, you could hear the fun in this album. I mean, this this joint right there, I mean, I just feel like even the cover shows it that that was Kane at that time. Like that was, you know, Big Daddy Kane, like he was the king of everything. So, um, I mean, really, I could say exactly everything Ben said with it. Um, but yeah, those are my, my top three. Now tell me this, Ben, I already know you because you've already said Kane and G-Rap are top three rappers for you with Rakim, right? That's correct. All right. So the question was, was, who from the Juice Crew cracks your top 10 greatest MCs of all time? We already know with Ben, two of them are top three. Porsche, what about you? Does any MC from the Juice Crew top crack your top 10 goat list? No, not my top right. 10. Okay. Not my top 10. As much as, and, and Ace would be the one that cracks it, um, but not a top 10, unfortunately. All right, no <laughs> doubt. Joe, what about you? I, uh, I have the same two that uh, Ben mentioned. Uh, cool G Rap and Big Daddy Kane. Um, you know, they don't need any introduction for fans of their music, but I think something you said earlier about like, why if folks, why and rate so high? And you could make the same argument for Cool G Rap. Just listen to their first few albums, right? And they're doing stuff that was unprecedented at the time it was released. You know, they really stepped up at the game. Um, so, you know, and of course there was the late 80s and the 90s, the whole decade of the 90s and 2000s where you had people like Eminem show up and Big, Jay-Z. Um, but I think it's a it's a testament to be from like the, the mid to late 80s and still make someone's top 10 in 2021, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's a piece of this. Uh, it's showing you what you've submitted for the culture. You know what I mean? Uh, and I've got the same too. I've got Kane coming in at my number six spot and G Rap at my number nine spot. And I think you, you know, the saying is, you know, were you outside at that time? And if you were outside at that time, you understand why it's so amazing what both Kane and G Rap did. You know, similar to somebody who grew up on and won basketball. A crossover isn't anything that incredible. So if you show them some Allen Iverson highlights, it may be like, oh well. The professor and hot sauce and AO and everybody was was doing that. But if you were there when Iverson was doing what he was doing in Philly in '96, like it, it wouldn't just be a. So I understand why some young folk are like, well, I mean, Kane's is dope, but I mean, but and I'm like, you always gotta you gotta go back to that time because nobody was doing it. 
You know what I'm saying? And that's such an important piece of the puzzle that you were pioneering this, that you pioneered this, like, you know, like, it's almost like I'm telling people like, yo, imagine the first time you seen somebody pull up with a Beamer. Like, you probably lost your damn mind because you had never seen a Beamer before. Now you may see Beamers all the time. It's like, oh, okay, whatever, whatever. But the first time, and that to me is what Kane embodies so much about rhyming, like rhyming with those skills and rhyming at those temples, you know? So I think, you know, that's the other piece too. Let's dive into the book for a little bit. Ben, what made you want to do a book on the Juice Crew? There's a million MCs, there's a million groups, there's a million people who you could have chosen to do a book on. Why do you pick the Juice Crew? Well, before I answer that, I'm glad you keep bringing up tempos with Kane because also in 1987, I discovered punk music and that's the other huge big love of my life. And you know, it's a very fast form of music and that's part of the appeal. And it's interesting that I'm getting into all these punk bands like Sex Pistols and the Ramones at the same time I'm getting into all this fast rapping and like fast, uh, like Public Enemy had really fast tempos for their time. And that was another favorite, that's my favorite rap group ever actually. Um, so, and then I'm sure Joe can relate. He's a punk drummer, so. <laughs> And he puts a little hip hop flavor in his beats, which is a big New York thing, which it's, makes sense because hip hop is a big New York thing. Right. Um, but go, but going back to uh, your question, Kill, about why I decided to write this book, um, like my favorite era of hip hop is the second half of the '80s, like eight, with '88 being the absolute peak of hip hop, and so. I think that the Juice Crew story, it's an interesting one. You have all these characters intertwining with each other. You have one of the greatest producers ever. You have several of the greatest rappers ever all working together. You have all these firsts. You have like a, the first disc record. You have, um, you know, the first guy to really go in hard on sampling. You have, you know, K and G rap changing the way people rap. You have even Rakim plays a little bit of, uh, of a part of it because Marley produced their, uh, his first single. And then you have this huge bridge war thing. So you have all these sort of um, phenomena happening all within the context of this one story. So it's almost like, how can I tell the story of the greatest era of rap and have it be a concise story with all intertwining characters? And that, like, if you think about it, that in that era, all, I'd say about a third of all of all the greatest records made were all coming out of the Juice Crew. I mean, like let's say if if you could think of the top eighteen or twenty uh, touring national hip hop acts, you know maybe four or five would be from Def Jam, and six or seven would be from Cold Chillin', and then the rest would be scattered amongst the other labels, and that's it. You have it, and so. It was a good way of telling a, a concise story about the greatest era of rap with all these really interesting characters who are all very different from each other. Like, you're not gonna put on a record, you're not gonna put on Marley Marley Control Volume 1 and hear Roxanne Chante and be like, who's rapping, is that Biz? Is that Kane? Like, their voices are all completely different from each other. There's no overlap, there's no redundancy. You have other crews where it's like, these these voices almost sound interchangeable with each other sometimes and so you don't have that at all and and so it just seemed like and plus there were already two books about Def Jam and there hadn't been a book about Cold Chillin and I thought wow how could how is there not already a book about this amazing record label with this amazing crew I've, I've got to write this Nice. Kind of like wanting something to exist in the world that doesn't already exist and then going about and doing it yourself. And there it is, it exists now. Which is a big punk rock for yourself. <laughs> yeah, why? <laughs> yeah. No. Now tell me this, what was the most challenging thing about writing this book? Like, what was the thing that just gave you that like, ah, like maybe it was an interview, maybe you couldn't get in touch with somebody, but what was the most challenging part about putting this book together? That was it. It was getting people on the phone. 
you know, some people I was never able to get on the phone. Some people took six months to get on the phone. And it's like, you know, I have to write the book at some point. So I'm just thinking maybe this isn't going to happen. And then sometimes, you know, some people pulled through at the last minute. Some I was never able to get a hold of. Uh, some people who I didn't even intend on interviewing, I interviewed and I'm like, boy, I'm glad I got a hold of that person. And so it was just a, this kind of painstaking journey uh, to try to connect with people. You know, I didn't know any of these people before hitting them up and saying, hey, I'm writing a book. Basically, hi, I'm a total stranger and I'm writing a book about your life. Do you want to talk to me on the phone for a couple hours? And like, right. some people are just put off by that. And some people are like, sure, I'll get on the phone with you today at, you know, in two hours. Does that sound good? It's like, yes, I will drop everything I am doing to get on the phone with you, of course. And some people were just like, yeah, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you. Six months go by. Finally, I don't know why, but they actually talked to me. So other, like the actual writing of the book, it's hard to get myself to motivate myself to get in front of my computer and actually start writing. But once I do, it's not difficult for me. Mm-hmm. So okay. it's a motivational thing. Yes. All right. What was the, the thing that was the biggest aha moment for you? Like, oh shit, I had no idea. Like, because I know reading the book, I had a whole lot of, oh, I sh- oh shit, I had no idea. I never thought about those two things or especially kind of like life at cool chilling after the Juice Crew. You know what I mean? So that's another piece I love about the book. Cause for me, I kind of I think a lot of people kind of dipped off after Kane and G-Rap and everybody started leaving cold chilling. It was kind of like. You kind of forgot about it and your book helped me to remember like nah we still had diamond shell we still had granddaddy IU, we still had the genius and things like that so what was that like oh shit moment for you like i had no idea i think it it might have had to do with the story about uh blind alley which is the sample you hear the main sample you hear in ain't no half step and just how easy moby is djing in his ha- in his apartment in um Lafayette Gardens, which is a housing project in uh, in in Bed Stuy, in Brooklyn, and and he's just playing Blind Alley, and then you have Biz. Biz happens to be there, and he's all he he, he, he calls uh, Easy Moby Booby. That's his nickname for him. He's like, "What's that, Booby?" And so um, he, Easy Moby's like, "Oh, it's this." this b-side of an emotion single emotions have big hits but that's not a hit that's not even it's a b-side it's not something you would have ever heard on the radio in the early 70s and so um then then he brings it to it makes its way down the line and it ends up ending it ends up on a cane record and then easy moby hears it on the radio like everybody else and he thinks wow i must have a good ear for this kind of a thing because this ended up on like kind of a hit single uh, with a big rapper, and 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 it and it kind of got him started on his career as a producer. And Easy Mo B is one of the greatest producers ever. Wow. And this is before he was a producer; he's just a DJ. And so I thought that was a really cool little story about just following how this one record ends up on, you know, being sampled, and then of course it gets sampled dozens of times after that because the cat is out of the bag it's on a rap record and i don't even know if this is in the book but there's epmd in an interview talked about how um uh bismarcky was had like a like a shop like a grocery bag with a re- with with either a tape or some records in it and he goes yo put this on rap over this song and he's trying to get them to rap over blind alley and they're like no like our our first single has already been recorded like we're good and then it ends up on a cane record so there's so many different characters who uh you know it, it gets cycled through that's dope that's dope that's dope now let them know where can they get the book at if they want to buy because i've been i actually have purchased this book for folk you know what I mean? That's how much everybody watched. I co-signed. One of my people was like, yo, I got to get that book, OG. I just got to wait till I get paid. I was like, fuck it. I'll buy it for you. Just, just <laughs> get the book. Like, just get the book. I've always sent them folk to Amazon. Where's the best place for them to copy the book from? Um, It's on Amazon. I used to sell copies of it. I don't even have any left myself. 
Um, I think there's a website. Oh man, I'm trying to find it. There's like a really good website. Okay, I have it. I, I'm just making sure that they still carry it. Yes, it's called bookshop.org and it's an alternative to Amazon. Um, and I think there's like, the way it works is like a portion of their sales support bookstores when you buy on their website. And so, yes, they do have it. I'm, look, I'm on the site right now, bookshop.org and just type in going off or type in my name, Ben Merlis or whatever, it'll it'll show up. Right, and it looks no like it, no it's at this moment in time, $22 and zero, uh, $22 and seven cents at Bookshop. Seven cents is always, <laughs> people always throw me off when it's some ill number like that, like $22 and seven cents. Um, so definitely everybody, y'all know me and Porsche, we are the bookworms of the hip hop world. Any podcast I'm on, I'm always shouting out books. Again, going off, amazing book. I I mean, I love it. Nice size. You get a lot of information. I always tell people, don't waste my time with something that I can't learn something from. So trust and believe it. I'm 47 and have been doing this hip hop shit since 83. Trust me, it's a lot for you to learn in here too. So definitely go support Ben and cop this book. You will not be disappointed. Talking about somebody you couldn't get in contact, bro. Molly. It's no. all these claims. It's I talked to him. Claims. I talked to him more than anybody else. We hung out in person several times while I was writing the book. He just didn't want to be quoted for the book. Oh, so okay. a lot of the stuff in there is first person information. Right, he told right. Me. Which I love about it. That's another reason why I love the book so much is that it's first person. But Ma there's so many claims in this book about Molly. And you know what? L let's do this first. Where does Molly Maul stand in your eyes as a GOAT producer? Does he crack your top 10 as a GOAT producer? Porsche, what about you, sis? No, he doesn't crack my top 10, um, but he's in my top 15 to 20, if okay. that makes sense, of all time. Joe, what about you? Uh, he does, because just not because of the, like his featured tracks or, and the Juice Crew, but his work with other people. Like heavy, and you know, um, MC Light, and the list goes on and on of people outside of the Juice Crew that he worked with, Third Base, um, LL, um, and if you know, in a in a in a certain time date range, he was the guy, right? So right. just own for that, you know, whatever five to six year period where he was just incredibly busy putting out stuff with his crew, working with other artists, he does crack my my top ten. Okay, Ben, what about you? Oh, of course. Come on. He's one of the reasons I wrote the book. He's got, he's, if he's not number one, he's definitely floating around in the top three or four. I mean, the thing is, if you think about guys like Large Professor or Pete Rock or Easy Mo B or uh, DJ Premier, like, do, are those guys better than Marley? Well, it's hard to even make it's hard to phrase that as a question because they're doing the marley thing like they're using the template that marley created to produce records which are great records and those guys are all within the top five or ten and so that's the thing like everything builds on on itself in, in hip-hop and so to it, it's like how much credit are we giving marley for inventing that style versus okay now the style's been invented how do i size up to this guy who who based his entire career off of what i invented like it, are pete rock's beats doper than mine well does it matter i invented the way that like the way you layer samples the way you put a drum machine below it to to beef up the beats the way you scratch in vocal samples from previous rap records direct for choruses the way, I mean, like all the stuff you take for granted as like the way, at least from a, from a late 80s, early 90s perspective, the way a rap record sounds and is supposed to sound, it all come, pretty much comes from him or he's at least puts it all together in one package. So yeah, he's top 10, sure, of course, top five, definitely. Number one, possibly. All right. Now here's the thing, y'all. Before your book, because your book just messed me all up, man.
before your book, Molly was number three for me, but behind Dilla and Primo. Um, and it was for everything that you just said. He had the template. You know, he was the first one who started chopping jumps, drums. For people who may not understand that, you have a breakbeat. You have Impeach the Present. You have Synthetic Substitution. It was the part of the album where as a group, the drummer just had a soul. So that was the breakbeat. So back in the parks, the DJ flashing them would just keep going back and forth between the breakbeat, which is why you needed two records. Come in a sampler, now you're just rapping over Impeach the President. You're rapping over Synthetic Substitution. Molly, if I'm not mistaken, was the first person to chop drums and say, I'm going to take the kick from Synthetic Substitution and the snare from Impeach the President, and I'm going to take the hi-hat from the skull snaps, and I'm going to replay it and program the drums myself. That shit right there is genius. So to me, he was so high up on, on, my, on my level because of the things that he did. Now, after reading your book, Ben, and for people who haven't read the book, a lot of artists on Cold Chillin' felt like we brought Molly the records. So Molly didn't produce the records. We produced the records. You know, he just engineered it. It's another thing that's like with writing rhymes, you don't write your rhymes then versus you write your rhymes now. You go to the studio now, the engineer's whole job is to mix your record, not to produce your record for you. So back in the 80s, when everybody didn't have drum machines and everybody didn't have Pro Tools and Fruity Loops or whatever you use, you know, you'd have to go to somebody's house. And the thing was at first, the long story short, the most of the story is Molly's still my number three. Because after even hearing all these claims that, you know, Biz brought all the records and Kane brought all the records and G-Rap brought all the records, it still was Molly that had to put all that stuff together. And I give this example, y'all know me and my analogies. Porsche, you are an excellent cook. When we have our apartment 5B meetup, you are the cook, okay? I go to the store and I buy all the ingredients and I bring them to you and you cook it. When all of us are eating, who are people gonna thank for making this food, me or you? <sighs> Okay, I mean, <laughs> I, I guess I'm a weird person to ask because they will they will thank me because I cooked it, but I would thank you for bringing the ingredients right then and there. So I I'm just that way. I know production doesn't work that way. Someone's no, not no, going to no. get I mean, credit. No, that, that's that's dope. That's dope that you would show me love. But the average person, I don't care if I went to eight supermarkets to get all the stuff for the sweet, for grandma's sweet right. potato pie. It would be me and because I put it together. Yeah. Right. Ain't nobody thanking me for going to five different grocery stores in Philly while everybody was sold out of sweet potatoes. They going to thank Auntie, Auntie May or whoever, grandma. That's who you going to thank for putting it all together. So I've always believed, and Diamond D used to do this. He used to give co-production credit, not money, but you would get co-production credit. If you look at Stunts, Blunts, and Hip Hop, do the line of notes, you will see co-production. If you see co-production, that means you brought Diamond the record because you brought a piece of the ingredient to this pot. You know what I mean? So I definitely do. I personally believe there should have been co-production credit if you brought the record. Me as a producer, I've only had that done to me like three times. When people say, Kill, I want you to sample this. That's not how I work. I, I The music has to speak to me. There's been plenty of times people come over here with samples like, Kill, use this. I can't. What do you mean you can't? I don't know what to do with that shit because it ain't speaking to me. I need, I'm a different type of producer. So I can't do that. And the three times people have brought me a record that did speak to me, I've always said you get co-production credit based off of you bringing me the record. But again, I tell folk all the time, it's all about how you were raised. The same way. We're talking with four different individuals. We should, we were probably raised four different ways. Maybe. Nothing wrong with the way Joe was raised or Porsche was raised. or It's just how you were raised. That's how I was raised on hip hop. So I do think that, you know, Kane and them, if they brought all the records and they just said, hey, hook this up, it's more than just hooking something up. That's all I'm trying to get people to understand that. To hook something up is not just as easy because I've had people say, kill, mix this on top of this. That shit don't go. It doesn't go. Like, it goes in your mind. I'm sure we've all thought something like, hey, I'm going to write this book or I'm going to write this script or I'm going to do something. And it, it fits perfect in your head. And then you try to do it and you're like, ah. It don't it don't work right it just isn't there so the the, the engineer back then deserves co-production credit and i hear the same thing from eric b all he didn't produce my melody or eric b's president you know we did or whatever whatever again i think it's a co-production thing so that's just my gist on when people talk about you know molly didn't do anything nobody brought the records and then it goes back to what joe was saying 
what he did for Mama said knock you out. Like LL was dead in the water. He literally brought LL back from the dead and won a Grammy while doing it. You know what I mean? And that all started with the Jingle Baby remix that Molly did off the Walking with a Panther album that had LL dead in the water. So Molly, even to this day, with all the accusation of records, he's still my number three. I just want to break that down because I always want this to be a learning opportunity for people watching to learn and kind of producers. We speak a whole different language. So I just want to bring you in and, and, and help folk understand who are producers, the way we think, the way we, we look at things, because the records are important. The record is the winning lottery ticket. I mean, if RZA gets the come clean sample before, you know, Primo finds it and he uses it first, I don't know. Does that does that edge, you know, Primo out from being one of the greatest? Of course, you love Troy. What if Pete didn't do Troy? What if Large Professor kept that record? You know, does Pete still hold the same? I know some people, you I've met people who say if you take Troy off of Pete's record, he slides, he slides far. I don't think oh, Pete man. slides that God, far. let's get those people but, here. I'm gonna have well, to have I, a know, I know, but I'm just saying that for some <laughs> people, it's like that's their song. You know what I mean? And I love Pete Rock because of Troy. So I'm just saying. Even through all that, Molly is still my number three. I think he's one of the greatest producers he did. And like Ben said, he literally made the template that the rest of us do. I always tell people, I don't think I would have been that smart. And a lot of these things were mistakes. Like, let's just keep it a buck. I don't know if Molly, I think Molly probably accidentally did something. I was like, oh shit, I can do that? Okay, cool. Well, let me keep trying to find out how to do it. Pete Rock, the same thing. I give a lot of credit to Pete Rock. He was the first to filter baselines. He said he was at Eddie F's house was messing around with the S950, made a baseline, and it was like, yo, let's roll with that. And we all see through the 90s, everybody was filtering their baselines. Everybody from the beat miners, the skied, and everybody in between was doing that. So that is why Molly is there with, with that's so important to me. Tell me this, Ben, were you about to say something? Because I see you on the mic, like you, you were about to say something. I was going to say, Marley is actually an early baseline filter guy for the, the first Master Ace album. Um, I want to say it was... Easy Mo B who told me that. Um, okay. But uh, the thing about Troy is that if you listen to the original song that the saxophone line comes from, he picks, like, it's a, basically a sax solo, and he's picking a tiny piece of that, and then he decides, I'm going to loop that, and that'll be the hook. And what are the chances anyone else would have picked the exact same part of that song and been like, that's the hook. Like, he had to hear it through this entire solo and so that's part of the brilliance of Pete Rock and that's why someone else using that same record wouldn't have it wouldn't have come up that exactly that way um, well, I also I also think that like just on that note um, I know you said uh, you know Marley's the template how could you you know compare or put all these other producers I think that there's something, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge um, advocate for pioneers and making sure that pioneers get their, you know, just do because obviously they pave the way, right? But you, we do have to leave some, some space for the student being better than the teacher and everyone has different ears for, for music. So for me, um, I, would, I would die on the hill that Pete Rock's production is better than other producers. Um, just off that, just off of the way, I mean, we've we've been on so many shows where we've talked about the intricacies of Pete Rock um, being able to save, like, I don't know, what was it, kill, like, 12, 12 recordings off of, like, eight buttons, and he was able to, like, do all of this the stuff. SP, that the SP has 10 seconds, so it was, like, always a genius move of how the hell did Pete, you know, do this, you know what I mean? And again, everybody's right. You know, at the end of the day, Marley B, I don't think you could go wrong with either or. It's just, you know, like Poor said, for me, being a producer, it's just for me, the template is is more important because without Marley, I don't know if Pete, Primo, and the rest of them are able to do what they do. You know, now for somebody else, it's kind of just like, well, I think now does Pete and Prem have a much longer discography than Marley? No doubt. You know what I mean? So it's we all judge things differently. You know what I mean? Your favorite basketball player, you may be looking for these three things. I may be looking for these three things. A person who plays basketball may be looking for totally three different things than what, you know, the person who just watches, watches for. So, I mean, again, I think it's one of those things like Ben said earlier with G-Rap and I'm like, whatever G-Rap album you pick, you can't go wrong. You right. know what I mean? And it's just like, you know, I'm sure. And like you said, there's always going to be times when the teacher, you know, the student becomes better than the teacher and everything like that. But Again, just for me, it's 
I, I think just me personally, the teacher holds a, a bigger spot in it. And that's because I'm a producer. You know what I mean? And I'm always able to openly say that because when I'm sitting here making a beat, I'm just sitting here like, yo, there's no way I would have thought to do that. Like, there's no way my brain would have said do that. You know, so you made it easier for me. It's almost like, um, you know, me and they are watching Boardwalk Empire. And it's all about, you know, of course, the, you know, gangsters in, in Jersey and Atlantic City. But it's also about building the Atlantic City Expressway, you know, which made it so much easier for us to get from Philly to AC to go hang out. So it's just like, again, it's just about who who paved the way. You know what I mean? So, again, I don't think you could go wrong with either or. Both are incredible producers. I'm trying to find this record to make an example of what you were saying, Ben. But I see you about to say something, Ben. Uh, the, the second P-Rock and CL Smooth album has, um, there's this, they used uh, Just Rhyming with Biz, the Big Daddy Kane uh, record. They used that song as a sample in eight tracks it's crazy it's like half it's more it's like half the album which i thought i think is really cool because he's able to use the same record and sample it eight different ways right and have it still sound fresh right now here's the thing for somebody who's watching this is a great example of record let me see record right here you know um i got the, this right here is jay-z streets is watching produced by ski beats it is also Beat Nuts Forever, produced by the Beat Nuts. It is also Hi My Name Is for Eminem, produced by Dre, all off the same song. Not the same album, the same song. So just a testament to what Ben was saying about, like, for Pete, to, even if somebody else had the Tom Scott record, which is somewhere around here, but even if somebody else had that, it doesn't necessarily mean that they would have heard. And this is what I mean by music speaks to us all differently, especially even as a producer, you know, because I remember the uh, beat miners telling a story about this Les McCann's joint, which I want to say was right here. Um, this joint right here. This is the 10 Crack Commandments. And for everybody watching, this ain't no sample snitching. This ain't none of that shit. So don't hit me in the inbox with stop snitching. Everybody knows these joints by now. This is 10 Crack Commandments. The Beat Miners were saying how they had this record for years and never thought to use that part. And then they hear the 10 Crack Commandments and it's like, fuck, Primo did it again. So again, just a testament to what Ben is saying, just because somebody may have had the Tom Scott tomorrow record doesn't mean you're gonna use it the exact same way Pete did. Uh, tell me this, what is your slept on album out to Juice Crew? The album that nobody ever talks about on the timeline, nobody ever brings up. What is your slept on album out of the Juice Crew? Uh, this looks like a job for it by Big Daddy Kane. It's his fifth album. And when it came out, it didn't do well. And Kane has talked about this on in multiple interviews, including in my book about how it was, the style of rhyming was more like an 88 style, like a faster rhyming. And, and it came out in 93 when it was all about you know smoking weed and rhyming slow and behind the beat and so mm -hmm. but you know 1988 was a million years ago 1993 was a million years ago it doesn't really matter at this point it's just a great record so i understand why it didn't it didn't work when it came out but in we have in hindsight it's a great it's a great album if you like the first kane album i can't imagine you wouldn't also like the fifth one all right, no doubt. Porsche, what you got? You guys already know it's going to be Master Ace. Take a look around. I never hear people talk about it. I barely hear people. I mean, here's the thing about Hip Hop Nation is when you mention Master Ace, everyone loves him and everyone has nothing but dope things to say about him. But nobody ever talks about him like on their own. So for me, I just think and somebody actually hit me up today. Like, when are we going to have a Twitter space about Master Ace being slept on and all his albums being slept on, especially disposable? I'm going to say it's the the one with um, off cold chillin like take a look around. I, I never hear anyone talk about it ever. Um, and it's a very, very dope album. It's an hour. I think it's just over an hour long. I'm telling you no skips. I can listen to Ace forever. Um, he's just that dope and he's that consistent. He really doesn't, I don't know, he just doesn't ever drop the ball. <laughs> like, I, I can't say that about many, you know, many um, MCs, but Ace just knocks it out of the park every time. So, yeah, take a look around, Master Ace. Were you a fan of the Master Ace Incorporated stuff too? 
Um, yeah, like, I would say. Because that was a departure from, like, you know, his usual stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was. But, I again, I think that Master Ace does a really good job of of changing that. Um, if he switches, you know, like, if he's going to change his style, he does it well. It, for me, I, I don't know, maybe it's just... I don't know what it is about Master Ace that I just love so much. Disposable Arts is one of my favorite albums. So um, Take a Look Around is not far behind. So, yeah. All right, no doubt. Joe, what's your Slept On Juice Crew album? Uh, just going by the criteria of nobody talks about it. And it's in line with Ben's, uh, this looks like a job for. But before that, after Big Daddy Thing, it was A Taste of Chocolate. Um, and before... You know, before anybody knew that it wasn't going to be as hitting as Big Daddy thing, how do you, how do you stay on par with an album like that? Right? But that album had really good cuts on it. Like it had uh, Mr. Pitiful produced by Cool V. It had like a uh, average white band sample on it, which like, you know, I don't know how it was like. Whoa, he he's changing his style again. And uh, a song called No Damn Good. There were some really good cuts on there because uh, I can do it right. And in terms of like Kane like timelines I, I kept listening to that like it was the first two records um, but like you said I, I don't hear anyone ever talk about that or bring it up and it's like like if there was a Spotify of this is Big Daddy Kane I wouldn't I don't think there would be any Taste of Chocolate cuts on but, you know alright alright and uh, I'm agreeing with my little sister tonight take a look around Master Ace album yes this joint yes right finally here. <laughs> I, I absolutely love this album um Five mics for me, easy. And the, and the crazy part is, I know a lot of hip hop heads, like people who love hip hop, who have never heard this album. You know, which is incredible to me because I'm like, bro, it's '89. It's Molly. This is Molly coming right off of Long Live the Kane. This is Molly coming off of Going Off. This is Molly coming off of G Rap's Road to the Riches. So you know the beats are crazy. Ace, you already know Ace is a monster just from what he did on the Symphony, then on In Control. Me and the Biz. That shit was everywhere. So, I mean, I, I just still never understand to this day, like, why people never heard this album. I'm 100% with Porsche. No skips on this. Love this album to death. Five my classic to me. Slept on MC out the Juice Crew that nobody talks about. Porsche, who's your slept on MC? Honestly, I feel like... Hmm, I would say Roxanne Chante. And I, and I would say that because... I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm one of them. I, I'm one of those people. Like, I don't talk about Roxanne Shantae. Although, when Roxanne Roxanne came out on Netflix, I was I watched it that same exact day it dropped. Like, I'm all about it. Um, but I don't ever, you know, like I am exactly, <laughs> I am exactly who we're talking about right now. Um, but I think Roxanne Shantae because everything unless it's about the beefs and and you know about what was going on with the diss tracks like nobody really brings up Roxanne Shantae and I, I don't know maybe it's because she was a, she was a like a female in the group at the time and it was you know uh hip-hop in its nascency almost and you know they're maybe that's the reason but I I'm gonna go with Roxanne Shantae because I think the dudes are like getting mentioned left center and right even even Master Ace if we're gonna you know <laughs> I can't say Master Ace is more slept on than her, so Roxanne right. Shantae for me. I think the problem with Shantae is what I what I talk about with the Roots. The Roots have such a long discography. You have Roots fans who have never heard things fall apart. Right. Or right. Elf, Half Life. It's like you have some Roots fans who their Roots affinity started with how I got over. You know what I mean? So they don't know. I think with Shantae, I don't think enough people really look at her as Juice Crew. Because I think what happens is a lot of people, that picture that I put up with Molly in control, Shantae is not on that cover. She's on the right, album right. with Whack It, which was probably right. the wackest on the album, which didn't help Shantae. So if you're my age, you know about Shantae and you know Roxanne's Revenge. Like Ben said, you know Have a Nice Day. You know yes. about the Bad Sister album. But if you got onto the Juice Crew post Long Live the Cane, you really yeah, didn't hear a lot never, of shit. That's facts. Facts. You know, so I think that yep. there are a lot of people who, when they think Juice Crew, they just don't think Roxanne Shante. Um, so which is and we're gonna tie that into something else with my pick too. Uh Ben, who do you have for your slept on MC out the Juice Crew? Craig G. Mm. Craig G is incredible. He's an incredible rapper. And <laughs> 
he, you know, he kept good company because, you know, he grew up in the same building as Marley and, and he was in from Queensbridge and, you know, with, along with tragedy and, uh, Roxanne Shante and, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, MC Sham. So, you know, he's, he put, makes his first record at 12 and, which is kind of incredible. He beat boxes on the Glamour Girls record. And then he puts out his first album while he's also on In Control and he does uh, Drop in Science, which I loved as a huge. kid. I have no idea Kim G's 15 years old when he makes this record. We think he's another rapper who's probably 19, 20. And then um, I think what, what kind of fucks it up is um, his first album has too much hip house on it. Exactly. Hip House was a big thing for about one year, which was 1989 going into 90. And then by the time the record comes out, Craig G doesn't even look like Hip House anymore. His second album is really good. It's called That's Now That's More Like It. And yep. uh, Marley produced that, uh, a lot of that. And, and that's a good record. If only he had made his first album was as good as his second, maybe we'd be saying different things all these years later but he i mean he's also an incredible battle rapper he wrote the rhymes for the battle scenes in eight mile um oh nice the the rhymes that eminem is not saying eminem mm -hmm. wrote his own rhymes but the people mm -hmm. he's rapping against craig g wrote those rhymes that's pretty is, cool yeah yeah and it's because you know he's done so many battles himself he kind of knows you know how to keep it realistic um yeah, if only he had more. He's a great rapper. If only he had more great albums under his belt, maybe he wouldn't be so low rated. Yeah, I, I yeah. think you you hit the nail on the head with Craig that the Kingpin album because I was waiting for that because Drop in Science, especially the remix to Drop in Science, uh, was just bananas to me. So when the Kingpin came out and like you said, Hip Hop House was a thing, but nobody was really doing hip hop house albums like most rappers just had that one hip hop house hip house song you know what i mean and craig kind of did the whole album has a dope song on there called dope duo which was crazy which i think most of us expected the whole album to be like that but it's funny that you bring up now that's more like it ben because we just did a show on five pivotal moments in your life and what was playing and i was saying when i was learning how to drive back in 89 90 that that was the album that I was listening to. Um, and I love that album. And again, this is another album of so many hip hop heads have never heard. Most people mm -hmm. are like, I didn't even know Craig G had a second album out. And most people who know Craig G, they know him from the symphony, but like you said, they either know him as a battle rapper or a freestyle rapper. Like, you know, cause for a while, Craig G's name was right, right there with Supernaturals and the Mad Skills and all those freestyle artists. So, but yeah, hundred percent right on that. Cause, uh, I really thought that that Kingpin album was going to be something special and, you know, because the hip hop house, it just wasn't. Joe, who do you have for your stuff on MC Alpha Juice Crew? Well, Ben just, you know, Ben took stole my thunder because I was going to say Craig G. I'm still going to say Craig G. And for everything he said, but I just want this podcast to record that there's some love for Duck Alert, which was on In Control. Because Very I thought, dope song. Yeah, I thought that was the like the funniest sample like i never heard a song that would clown dj red alert with like you know <laughs> quotes from i don't know what i don't know if he's sampling star trek or uh, some kind of movie but he marley's like talking to red alert in between craig's verses but um that's a great record off of in control craig g is awesome he's got the legendary like freestyling and battling and you know the eminem stuff and that um now that's more like it was was really good but like like, like you said it, 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 he jumped the shark a little bit with the hip house um with kingpin but that doesn't mean what you know it's still worth listening to if you if anyone out there wants to go go back and research craig g's catalog um but yeah i i have to say craig g as well all right i'm going with mc shan i feel like mm. mc shan like you know how we cancel everybody nowadays? Like, you know, especially black folk, we will cancel somebody in a heartbeat. Like, and it's just like, you are no more. Like you have been erased from time. I feel like the L he took to KRS and BDP, like just canceled MC Shan. And I don't think anybody wanted to hear anything from MC Shan ever again. I mean, truth be told, down by law, his first album, here's the 
thing, the bridge is still an incredible song. Yes. Like, and I know it's hard to, you know, because you just think, oh, the bridge is over and South Bronx. And, but I mean, in context, and again, it's what I mean by you had to be there. When the bridge came out, the bridge was the shit. Like, that beat, the rhymes, you know, we got Craig, I mean, we got MC Shannon and Molly Maul in the house. They just came back from off tour. Like, that was a huge song in hip hop. You know, now, of course, the bridge is over, is big or South Bronx, but I just feel like Shan gets such a bad rap for losing that battle. Like, dog, you lost to KRS-One. You lost to one of the greatest MCs of all time. It's not like Shan lost to some dude, you know. You like know, me. And, and it's not like he, he lost to me. <laughs> random MC like you know from like he lost to KRS one like you know what I mean but that doesn't diminish that Shan was very good and I'm telling people the second album Born to Be Wild in 88 had some shit on there I pioneered this Juice Crew Law So Deaf I was just listening to this album today and it's got bangers on it this is 88 Molly this is the same Molly that cooked up for Kane it's the same again I think people just may lose context, but but this is the same Molly that's in the same bag. And Molly talks about how he would use a lot of the same sounds for all of them. So if you like the production on Kane and Biz and G Rap, this down this Born to Be Wild album, just just do me this justice. If you haven't heard it, YouTube so down and tell me that that shit is not crazy. That shit was crazy. But again, after the the Bridge Wars, nobody wanted to hear anything. Shan had to say it didn't also help that Shan was light skin with a red Kangol. LL is light skin with a red Kangol. They both from Queens. That didn't help either. So I got MC Shan as my slept on person. Tell me this, y'all. As a production crew, I mean not a production crew, as a hip hop crew that we've had so many in hip hop. Does the Juice Crew make your top five of crews? And if so, where where are they? Ben, where are you at with the Juice Crew? Do they make your top five hip hop crews of all time? In the words of Big Daddy Kane, number one with a motherfucking bullet. Okay. Okay. And you know, like, the day I signed my book deal, um, I went on Facebook and I said, "Hey, I just got a deal. I'm going to write a book f- for the um, about the the greatest." hip hop collective that ever existed. And there were a few people who had the nerve to be like, um, actually that would be the native tongues. It's like, are you, <laughs> like I got, I've never written a book in my life. And like BMG wants to put this, wants to, you know, allow me to do this. And, and you're, 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 uh, you're adding me. <laughs> and I thought that was funny, but of course that's totally something I would do too, to someone else. So I, I understand. Um, but yeah, they're my favorite. And, and for the same reasons I talked about earlier, there's no, everyone has their place. There's no redundancies. There's no mistaking one guy's voice for someone else's voice. Um, they kind of have it all. They cut co- all bases covered and they got Marley producing at least in the in the beginning. Um, so, you know, there are other great crews, of course. Flavor Unit is another great one. Um, I could go on down the down the list. I love how you have an episode about um, the uh, Herbie Lovebug crew, yeah, that which I thought was about. Yeah, and I think and I think maybe what hurts that is there's no name for it. You know, right? It's like, yeah, and, and you see, even during that episode, my man, my OG Roots had to tell me it was the Idol Makers. You know, which to me isn't a dope name. I'm just <laughs> you know, there's no catchiness in the Idol Makers. But yeah, I think. And again, a lot of people don't even know that that was a crew. You know what I mean? I think that's also the problem with the Hurry Love Bug crew that, you know, people may know Kim playing Salt and Pepper and Kwame ran together, but then they don't know about Dana Day, Sweet Tea, and Antoinette. So, you know, but yeah, it, it's been a lot of dope crews. Porsche, what about you? Juice Crew does crack my top three. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to it's hard to just dismiss the level of talent that is like just weaved within that crew um marley is n- is obviously i mean the template he's no joke like they have a powerhouse producer um they've got these top tier mcs like it's just i would i would question someone who wouldn't have the juice crew in their top five or top three even um so yes it's in my top okay. three joe what about you good brother 
Yeah, uh, top three easily. If you know, if, if top five is your line, I would even say top three. And when you were talking about the native tongues, like, and you put it in a nerdy voice, your know, native tongues was dope too. Like you know, <laughs> nerdy voice. <laughs> because I, I don't know, it sort of felt like you know, like it was like a person or from someone from the nineties that like didn't know about the Juice Crew, maybe or you know, who would just like automatically put like Wu Tang or you know G Unit, and you know. Nothing wrong with that, but I think the Juice Crew, just based on like the, like portion Ben said, the Marley Marl kind of like as the Phil Jackson, and you had mm-hmm. G Rap and Kane as like the Jordan Pippen, just that 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 talent level um, was nothing that wasn't seen in the crew back in like 1986, 87, 88. So based on like just planting a flag and like. This is a crew. Yeah, you know, I didn't. Even, I didn't even mention Bismarcky. I just forgot. But look at the look at that assembly of of, of mm-hmm. rappers you know, and Marley Marl like at the at the helm. Like that was just easily makes my top three crew. Nice. All right. For me, it gets a little iffy. They make my top five either which way. But while doing all this stuff for the show, I started thinking: Is it really the Juice Crew if Marley didn't produce it? Yeah. So even because it's kind of like if Riz, when people are like, oh, it's a Wu-Tang reunion. I'm like, is Riz producing? No, I'm like, then it's not a Wu-Tang reunion for me. You know, it's right. that's part of Wu-Tang. Like RZA has to be producing for it to be a Wu-Tang reunion for me. The Juice Crew, either which way they make it. If we're only talking about Molly producing, they, they're probably four or five. If we're right. talking just everybody out the crew, then they're probably number one. You know what I mean? Um, but that would kind of be my little, you know, asterisk that it's like if we're talking just Juice Crew, because now we're only talking everybody's first album. We're not talking it's a Big Daddy thing. We're not talking about the second and third uh, G Rap. We're not talking about any biz albums. We're literally just talking about the first Ace, the first King, which is still dope enough to crack my top five. Um, so either which way they make my top five. But for me, if we're only saying Juice Crew is being produced by Molly Maul, then they will probably slide down a little bit more to the left. Um, Biz, one thing I love, we've all shown Biz love on the show for various things, different topics. Tell me this, Porsche, what 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 did Bismarck mean for you? Like, what is one of your favorite Biz memories? Yeah, um, I mean, we talked about this on Twitter Spaces. Love talking about it. I mean, I talk about it forever, but for me, it's um, Biz's unique approach to everything he did and to and he always i feel like whether it was his rapping the the um subject matter in which he rapped with which we know is kind of like um it could be serious it could be uh jokey it could be funny or it could be like you know there's just a lot of personality there and um i think biz like one of my favorite things about biz is no matter what he did he always did it in a way that set himself apart from everybody else um and he did it with such focus and diligence that he almost perfected it you know um that the beatboxing uh is one of my favorite things that biz ever did um and then of course like just his passion for for collecting and digging and um you know all of that so for me like biz is just the epitome of a artist, a creative, and s- somebody who just exudes the love of music in general. And he did that all throughout his life. He did that um, with everything that he did. And even in interviews, like even when he was talking, that passion and that love was always conveyed. And I, those are, yeah, that's that's my favorite thing about Biz is just the personality, the fun, and then all of the, um, sort of the more serious stuff that he still was able to convey in a very like I want to say in like a approachable way like it was never you know it was never like standoffish or anything he was just such a warm warm person it seemed like so yeah that's dope Ben what about you what are some of your favorite what does biz mean to you oh well the thing about biz that we need to remember even though people love that he's fun and funny and jokey and kind of like a big kid is that he put together this posse of TJ Swan singing the hooks on his records. No one did that before. I mean, people sang hooks on records, but TJ Swan was the guy who sings the hook on a record. He's pre, um, 
he's pre Nate Dog, he's pre T Pain, you know. Mm-hmm. He's a, and so I think Biz had the vision for that. He, cool V as his DJ, his cousin, and then ha- get it bringing Big Daddy Kane in the fold, being a rhyming partner with Big Daddy Kane. If you listen to this is on, you probably find it on YouTube, but if you have the CD version of Make the Music with Your Mouth Biz, there are live bonus tracks of Kane and Biz singing X rated Christmas rhymes live <laughs> to an audience. And they are so friggin' funny. So you have him reckon, seeing the brilliance in Kane, bringing him into the fold kind of accumulating all this talent around him and then linking up with the Juice crew eventually. And so um, I think he was a visionary. So, and he also had this thing, and this is part of his mystique, is that he didn't want people to know where he was from. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't even know exactly where he grew up. I associate him with Long Island, but you know, there's so many conflicting things about what high school he went to, what town, whatever, where he was actually born. And so it's just like, let the mystique, let him have his mystique, you know? Yeah. I think right. wrestling, wrestling, they call it parts unknown. Different parts yeah. unknown. <laughs> where he, wherever he laid yeah. his hat was his home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Joe, what about you? Uh, what did Biz mean to you? Um, well, I guess he meant everything that he means to you guys and everybody else who's been, you know, paying tributes and mourning him um, for the last week. But I think the best thing about him was the little things like he did that weren't associated with rap or, you know, entertaining. Like, um, he kept himself in, like, the public eye. He did Yo Gabba Gabba. And he did, like, that, that scene in Men in Black 2. Um, you know, the... In 88, I think it was the beginning of the Paul Simon, me and Julio down by the schoolyard. Mm. The the intro is just Biz beatboxing for Kane, who is introducing Paul Simon. And, you know, on YouTube, you can catch the video. It's amazing. Uh, Spud Webb and Nicky Mantle are also in the video. But it's Biz and Kane in a park just introducing a Paul Simon video. Like, it it was not the the most hip hop thing to do, which was so great about it. You know, it's like, let me step outside the comfort zone and mess some people's heads up. I'm messing Paul Simon fans' heads up. I'm messing, you know, strictly hip hop people's heads up. You know, um, he also did uh, Benny and the Jets on the, with the Beastie Boys, like things like that that fell out of the comfort zone of most hardcore hip hop fans. He wasn't afraid to do stuff like that, so I, I admired him for that. You know, um, I want to say it was T.J. Swan who I talked to in my book, he explained that, this is interesting, that on Long Island, Long Island was more of a mix of people than maybe the the boroughs were, uh, where you had neighborhoods that were predominantly one ethnic group over another, and you had kids in, black kids in Long Island listening, listening to rap radio, but also listening to classic rock radio, and so you have a lot of Steve Miller band, um, samples in you know nobody beats the biz Benny and the Jets like like biz was a huge up uh, obviously Gilbert O'Sullivan unfortunately he was a huge fan of you know 70s classic rock as well as the funk and soul stuff that pretty much every rapper was a fan of so right. you have that widening of the musical palette with biz Markey. um and me and Joe we, we we know we already have a mental list of all the all the punk rock, hardcore punk rock samples that haven't been used by anyone yet because we, we've got that on lock, right? I mean, <laughs> we're gonna tap into that one of these days. And so there is a there was a little magical part along with the '80s, like the late '80s hip hop. There was also in New York City mostly. There was this crossover movement where you had uh, Kill. I was telling you, like hardcore was sort of a distant cousin to rap, and also a distant cousin to like thrash metal. So that's where it evolved, like the crossing of, like crossing the stream. So later on in the 90s, you had Public Enemies sampling um, Slayer for She Watched Channel Zero, or Anthrax doing Bring the Noise with Public Enemy, and, and KRS One doing the intro to a Sick of It All record. That all happened organically in New York, and, you know, to, to what Ben was saying, there was a lot of, like, cross pollination 
Um, and for Long, I didn't know that about Long Island, um, but I assume it was like that for other places too, where you just had an open mind, and there wasn't only two radio stations. You had all these radio stations. You could listen to anything. So um, there are there was a little crossover period, which rap was part of, with also hardcore and like thrash metal. So just wanted to add that in there. Uh, dope, dope, dope. And to me, um, from what me and Porsche talked about on our Twitter spaces, you know, it was explaining to people like, yo, kill, why, why, you know, Biz a legend. I mean, you had just a friend. I'm like, bruh, you got to go back and do the knowledge. Like VH1 had something a couple of years ago on One Hit Wonders and they had Biz for just a friend. I'm like, fuck just a friend. We could just go back to the 12 inch and make the music with your mouth, Biz, you know, then going into Nobody Beats the Biz. Then going into picking boogers, the vapors, the going off album, everything that Biz has done, and I broke down how this dude is a legend just for beatboxing. Because when Biz mm-hmm. came out, there was only two beatboxes. There was Buffy from the Fat Boys and Dougie Fresh. Dougie Fresh. That was it. That's all we needed. Nobody was sitting around like, oh, we need another beatboxer. Here comes Biz with Shantae with the Death Fresh crew, and it was like, yo, this dude is different than Buff, and he's different than Dougie. Yo, and people don't understand how hard that had to be. You know what I mean? To to be different than the two beatboxers who had the game on lock and for you to come in and make a name for yourself. For me, Doug is a legend for beatboxing and so is Buff. So if that's the case, then Biz gotta be a legend in that category. From the MC category, from the albums he dropped, I mean Spring we we can talk about going off. I'm talking Spring again. I'm talking about the dragon. I'm talking about Biz using samples before other people were using samples. So even as the MC function, but then when he understood that the MC game was changing, he was able to flip into this incredible DJ. You know what I mean? And if you've ever been to a Biz party, then you understand how incredible Biz was as a DJ slash, like Portia said, record collector. Any record collector, any digger around here who knows anything about digging knows Biz name is godly in that category too. Just alone for the 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 mysterious, does he really have Bob James take me to the Mardi Gras without the bells? Like, there's just so many mysteries behind Biz in the records he says he has, does he have them? I mean, he literally is like a superhero. It's like, it, it, and I said it on the show, it's like Jay with a million and one questions where it's like, does he really have a block? Does he really make that much money? Like, that's Biz. Like, does Biz really have two houses? Does he really have a whole house just for records and toys? And does Biz really have that album? And just the fact that you can have that type of legend and that type of lore, I can't really think off the, the top of my head any other MC who you're really wondering about and you're really questioning like does q-tip really have an sp1200 like yeah he has an sp1200 or you know does primo really use the mp6 like and that's biz you know and just a piece to show how much i've always loved biz is maybe about 10 not nah, this had to be 20 30 make not about 20 years ago you had this biz mark uh action figure that came in the biz cereal box and you spark this And it's only like maybe a hundred of these made. And you got the Bismarck right here. That's you so got, dope. You've got the mic. You see, I've never even opened it. You've still got Biz and the microphone. You got the ring. You got the pick and booger finger. <laughs> and it used to it used to be able to beatbox. I think it's dead now. But yeah, you used to be able to squeeze and it would be like a one-two, a one-two. So this is just a testament to how much I fucked with Biz. You know what I'm saying? So just something, a little, little treat out there. No live folk ain't never seen that joint. But um, yeah, Biz is just a, a, a living legend. I know it happens a lot of times. People die and we just throw the, you know, we, we, we tag them with legend just because out of respect for them passing away. But Biz was definitely, definitely uh, a legend. Ben, you about to say something? Yeah, I have a I have a anecdote about Biz. Um, you know the um, me and the Biz music video, Master Ace. He's he's doing the voice of Biz Markey, right? And uh, himself, and he has that. It almost looks like a paper mache Biz Markey doll. It's not actually paper mache. I forget the material it's it's made of, but that actual doll. So. Maybe two years ago, there was this giant uh, photo, hip hop photo exhibition at the Annenberg in Los Angeles. And Vicky Toback put it together. She put together this great book called Contact High, which is oh. a visual history of hip hop. It's all photo, like famous photographs. Me and Kill own that book. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah we, the, we both have that book. Vicki Toback's amazing. Um, and I interviewed her for You Discover Music, and she gave me a tour. She gave me a tour of the exhibition before anybody. We weren't even allowed to be in there. The floors were being waxed. And yeah, there it is. And um, I said, so, you know, in the, in the exhibition, not only did they have the, uh, all these famous photographs, but they had Rakim's jacket from the Follow the Leader album, you know, the Dapper Dan jacket, and, and, and the crown that Biggie's wearing in that photo behind your head, Porsche, yeah. in, in the display case. And so I said, are you going to have the Biz doll here? And she said, we were going to, it's in New York, we were going to fly it out here to LA and buy a plane ticket for it and put it in, <laughs> strap it into the seatbelt with the guy who's going to come out here with it. <laughs> but the thing is disintegrating. So wow. it's, yeah, whatever material it was made of, it's disintegrating. It's not, it's, Oh, they can't. They can't keep it. They can't. No, they can't uh, restore it. They should restore it somehow. Damn. Yeah, but I just thought That's I crazy. just I picture that that Biz doll with his own airplane's window. Airplane. Yeah, yeah. No yeah. kidding. That would be dope. That would be dope. Well, look, y'all. Dope show about the Juice Crew. Yeah, I mean, definitely one of my people on the timeline was like, yo, OG, I don't really know a lot about the Juice Crew. I'm ashamed to say that. I'm like, yo, ain't never, no shame in not knowing. The shame is when you don't do the knowledge. So prayerfully, this show will help folk who don't know a lot about the Juice Crew. Then talk about, the, oh, I'm sorry. What's up, Joe? I was going to say, if, I don't know if you were closing right now, but I just want, I didn't want the podcast to end without two things. Um, while we were on the biz, um, one of the songs I was listening to, you know, just to retro, was uh, off of Cool G Rap's second album called Erase Racism. And it's uh, it's basically just G Rap and Kane doing the verses and Biz like bringing it all together, like doing the intro, the middle part, and outro. And just I just thought it was kind of poignant that at the end of this song, he's like, I'd like to say hello to all the nationalities and, you know, let's all get together and stop racism. Let's just stop that. And that was 1990. So in this day and age, like, you know, it's funny to think like if things have been bad, it was bad back then. And and the Juice Crew was speaking about it on whoever's stoop that was in the video. But that's, that's a, I, you know, that's a good Juice Crew song. And then for Portia, I just want to know, because she's just a massive Ace fan. Um, Brand New Heavies, uh, the album is called Brand New Heavy, Heavy Rhyme Experience. And there's a song called Wake Me When I'm Dead. Doesn't get a lot of play, but it's one of my favorite Master Ace songs. He's it's with a live, it, it's a live band playing, and he's rapping over a live band. He's got his great line: um, "You're so busy staring and daring kids to shoot you." According to the Jetsons, there's no blacks in the future. I just when I first heard that, I'm like, man, it's still with me to this day. That that must have been like 1992 that album. Um, but that's my Master Ace contribution because I don't want it to go you know, on a Juice Crew show without mentioning that either. Thank so. you, I appreciate that, Joe. And I know I didn't I haven't talked about Master Ace at all, barely on this in this podcast, but he's my favorite guy. Like if one I got one thing out of making this book, it's meeting him and, and being and making friends with Master Ace. He's, he's just a nice. great guy. I can't say enough about him and his resilience. And you know, he I has MS it. and he's had it for like twenty one years. And he's I just believe it. the most prolific guy, puts out records towards Europe all the time, like just pushing on and he's like now he's got he's really into like long distance bicycling you know he's totally like i know there shouldn't be role models but he's kind of like a role model for life i think nice that's dope yeah. that's dope that's dope that's so well, dope ben i appreciate y'all ben let them know where they can get the book at again where they can follow you at where they can get at you everything going off cop this y'all asap like fife said not now but right now Haha. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so bookshop.org, I would recommend looking there. I mean, I know they have it for sale. That's a good alternative to Amazon. Amazon probably still has it too. And then uh, you want to check out uh, my social media presence. It's on Instagram at coldchillinbook. And that's my, well, that's my only Instagram account. So okay. it's kind of funny when people want to talk about other stuff that don't, that doesn't relate to 
hip hop music or cold chillin and it's it, they tag me and it's like that's me so <laughs> <laughs> nice all right, tell me this, bro. What's what's up next? Will you, will you got some second? You got an idea coming or top I'm secret? Actually, I'm writing a a story for uh, Trust Records. Is this new uh, punk rock reissue label that just started, and they're doing a magazine. And I'm writing an article right now about the convergence of hip hop music and punk music um, in the early '80s. And this is around the same time as the Beastie Boys and completely nice. separate the band's Youth Brigade and Seven Seconds both have punk records that have rapping in them. And so I interviewed the singers of both those bands and about their history with hip hop. And I got really interesting answers from both of them. So I'm, gonna, I'm writing that article right now. And it's funny you've been talking about punk because this Beastie Boys book has me, you know, digging more into that punk of the 80s, you know, just because I mean, this book is so crazy. But just digging into the whole punk movement of what was coming up in New York City in the 80s like that around the same time with the Beastie Boys. So that's very dope. Joe, let them know where they can get at you. Where's your band playing at? Let them know everything about you, good brother. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Um, Well, live music has kind of been, you know, kind of uh, been sort of come back. But um, we have an Instagram at Outburst NYHC. And we, we update it when there are shows, which haven't been since the pandemic. But... You can find all kinds of cool, like, stories about the band and old flyers and photos and things like that. And um, we have stickers, which is very graffiti-like, if you guys like graffiti. I just happen to have them here. <laughs> oh, we nice. have a merch site called on coldcutsmerch.com. Cold cuts you can get this logo, which this logo that I showed Kill earlier, this shirt's been worn by, like, Vinny Pass and Jedi Mind Tricks and... And Lucas Fischetti from Odd Future is a picture of him sitting next to Drake with that shirt. It's also it's all on like coldcutsmerch.com. But Kill, you showed the Beastie Boys book um, just a minute ago. Mm. It's funny because it's in my office, my desk here. I have a uh, this was put out by um, Ita Italian hardcore fan in Italy. It's a, a bunch of people in the like late '80s uh, hardcore figures. And in front of CBGB's, which is down the Lower East Side, and in in the corner here, it's based on all famous poses, like actual pictures. And there's the Beastie Boys, like a caricature of them. <laughs> and then there's me with my band, like fat. <laughs> Those are real pictures. I could I could always like fill you in on the the, the real photos. That's there's dope. like Youth of Today is in here, Warzone. These are bands that Ben would easily know, but. That's what I mean. There's such a crossover of hardcore culture and, and hip hop, and the Beastie Boys had a lot to do with that. But I just figured when the Beastie Boys came up, I had to, sh I had to show this off. That's dope. Nice. That's dope. That's and dope. it happened on the West Coast too. It wasn't just in New York. I just want to make that clear because no, I represent LA, and there was a club called The Radio, and Glenny e. Friedman, who took all the photographs of all those, like the Public Enemy and Ice T albums, he, he bounced between coasts, and he took a lot of punk rock photos and skateboarding photos too in the 80s. And he would bring people. He would bring punk rock guys like Sean Stern from Youth Brigade to clubs like the Radio to see Ice T play, or the Olympic Auditorium to see UTFO and the Real Rock Stand. Right. And and I can't wait for this article to come out. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's dope. That's dope. That's dope. Porsche. Let them know where to get at you, Miss. Just on Twitter at Cherche La Porsche. That's it. <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> I'm gonna right. right now as soon as this ends. <laughs> cool. All right, no doubt. You already know me. Kill 889, Twitter, IG, willmakebeatsforfood.com. Me and Vegas' album, Willmatic, is out right now. It's a dedication to his cousin, the late Ill Will out of Queensbridge. Yes, the Ill Will that Nas is always talking about. We did an album dedicated to Ill Will as Vegas' cousin. Uh, check it out at vegasworldinc.bandcamp.com. All proceeds from the album of the merch goes to Ill Will's mother. If you know Nas' verse, The Second Child, he talks about never curse in front of Miss Versi. That's Ill Will's mother. My man Vegas is odd. So all proceeds from album and any of the t-shirts or the merch is going to Ill Will's mom. Again, Ben, Joe, thank y'all for y'all time. It was a pleasure thank having y'all on. Definitely gotta get y'all back on and chop it up with some more. Of course, I'll check you on the timeline, Miss. For sure. Take care, guys. Have a great day, y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye.